be strong. I'm going to be reading in Revelation 22, 6 through 21. And he said to me, These words are trustworthy and true. And the Lord, the God of the spirits of the prophets, has, has sent his angel to show his servants what must soon take place. And behold, I am coming soon. Blessed is the one who keeps the words of the prophecy of his book. I, John, am the one who heard and saw these things. And when I heard and saw them, I fell down to worship at the feet of the angel who showed them to me. But he said to me, You must not do that. I am a fellow servant with you and your brothers, the prophets. And with those who keep the words of, his, of this book, worship God. And he said to me, Do not seal up the words of the prophecy of this book, for the time is near. Let the evil doers still do evil, and the filthy still be fi filthy, and the righteous still do right, and the holy still be holy. Behold, I am coming soon, bringing my recompense with me, to repay each one for what he has done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginner and the end. Blessed are those who wash the robes, so they so that they might have the right to the tree of life, and that they may enter the city by the gates. Outside are the dogs and the sorcerers and the sexual, sexually immoral and the murderers and the idolaters and everyone who loves and practices falsehood. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you about these things for the churches. I am the root and the descendant of David, the bright morning star. The spirit and the bride say, come. And let the one who hears say, and hears say come, and let the one who is thirsty come. Let the one who desires take the water of life without price. I warn everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book, if anyone adds to them, God will add to him the plagues described in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words of this book of this prophecy, God will take away a share in the tree of life and in the holy city, which are described in this book. He who testifies to these things says, Surely I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. The grace of the Lord will be with all. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Katie. Would you pray with me as we begin? Our Heavenly Father, once again, we count it a privilege to be together as your people. We count it a privilege to recognize your grace and your mercy in giving us your truth, making yourself known to us, revealing yourself to us. And Father, we humble ourselves before you and before your word and submit to you and to your word. Father, have your way with us, through us, and in us this morning. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Pastor Dre is right. The last sermon in Revelation. Uh, I believe in my notes, I think this is number 35 total that we've taken to work through the book of Revelation. And uh, taken a year and a half or so. And so it's been a good study. It's been good for me to go through it. Trust it's been a blessing to you. And I um, want to, in a kind of in a way, start the message this morning the way I started uh, the very first message. So I'm sure that you will remember this. Um, but just with a simple question, where is your hope? Where is your hope? I wanted to give us just a reminder of the book in general put this slide out there a number of different times, but if there's a way to kind of summarize the whole book, give it in a little diagram, it would be right here. From intro to conclusion, John is not just getting revelation from God, he is experiencing it, he is hearing it, he is seeing it, feeling it. It's an apocalyptic vision of the future. Wrapping up and concluding the larger story, really, of all mankind, of history, that began when God said, let there be light. When God created in the beginning. Now we are reading the end of those things. Everything is finding its resolution here in Jesus Christ, in his return, in making all things new. And our verses here at the end, verses 6 through 21, provide the, uh, the conclusion. And so these verses kind of provide a conclusion for this fourth vision that John has experienced. That kind of, uh, the third vision ended with Jesus' reign here on this earth. 
the defeat of Babylon, of his enemies, and the statement of making all things new. And this fourth vision includes the new Jerusalem, the new heavens and the new earth, the, the new Eden, if you will. And so these verses provide a kind of some concluding remarks to the fourth vision, but also to the whole book. And he really begins how he started. And so I want to begin how we started. We started with the big idea in the book of Revelation. Painting the picture for us as God's people, painting the picture as a reminder for us of the ultimate supremacy of God and the unrivaled preeminence of Jesus Christ. The whole book of Revelation and all of these future events need to be seen with the backdrop of God on his throne and of Jesus Christ reigning. It's the only way to understand what we are reading. And quite frankly, it's the only way to understand our lives. Of the ultimate supremacy of God. Seeing everything in our lives through the lens of the ultimate supremacy of God and the preeminence, the first place of Jesus Christ. And in light of those things, the, the, the letter of Revelation to those seven churches in chapters 2 and 3 is, is a kind of wake-up call, is a reminder to remain vigilant in the face of opposition. We face opposition as God's people. We are swimming upstream, as it were, through the course of this world and in this culture. Really, no matter what culture we find ourselves in, we are swimming upstream as God's people, facing opposition, and we must remain vigilant. And we must remain uncompromising in our loyalty to Jesus Christ. As God's people, our loyalty to Jesus Christ is not one of any number of different loyalties in our lives. It is the one loyalty that shapes all other loyalties. And we study through Revelation to be reminded of the supremacy of God, of the preeminence of Jesus Christ, so that today, as God's people, we remain vigilant in the face of opposition and uncompromising in our loyalty to Jesus Christ. That's why we've studied this. The book of Revelation is not just about what's going to happen in the future, kind of satisfying our curiosity about what is going to happen. It's so much more. It brings everything to reality, into perspective. And so we started with a question as we were working through chapter 1. Where is your hope? What is it in your life that gives you confidence that you are going to be okay? What is it in your life that gives you assurance that everything this week is going to work out And what gives you motivation to just keep going on for God? What's your hope? I'm going to be all right. This all is going to work out. And I need to keep going on for God. What is it that gives you hope? However you've answered that, are you 100% sure beyond a shadow of a doubt that that is true and that's trustworthy and worthy of your confidence, worthy of your assurance, worthy of your motivation. Because the book of Revelation presents us with this better hope, with a better hope that there is someone who gives us confidence that we will be okay, that this will work out, there will be resolution, and it is worth persevering for God. And that person is Jesus Christ and his return. And as I've said here in verse 6, chapter 22, John begins in a way, or ends in a way that he begins with just these couple of this statement. And he, this is the angel that is walking him through these visions. And he, that is the angel who showed him the the new Jerusalem, the new heaven and the new earth. This angel says to him, these words are trustworthy and true. 
trustworthy, and true. These words. Is it just verses 26 through 27? Is it just this vision that he's seen? Or is that the whole of this letter of Revelation? Suggest that it's the whole of the Revelation. These words. John, what you are seeing and hearing are these things are true. This is significant for us. What does it mean for something to be true? It means that these words accord and conform to what is real, what is reality. And it's important for us as God's people to remember and to recognize that God doesn't conform to anything. It's not as if there is truth out there and God conforms to truth. God is truth. He establishes truth. He is the definition of what is true. And in all of reality, everything in your life conforms to what God has said is true. And whenever God speaks, he speaks truth. They are true, and they are trustworthy. This is really where the rubber meets the road for us as God's people. Probably all of us here in this room would have the conviction, or at least be willing to say that we recognize that this is the Word of God, and what is in the Word of God is truth. It is absolute truth. It, it shapes our lives. It, it speaks to reality. But John doesn't just say, the angel doesn't just say, hey, this is truth. He says it is trustworthy. It is worthy of building your life upon. These words are true and are worth trusting in. They are worth allowing these truths to shape your emotions, to shape your actions, to shape your reactions. These words are true, and they are trustworthy. They are worth you trusting and shaping your perspective on. How I see other people, how I see myself, how I make sense of this world and events and other people. These words are true and trustworthy. It's one thing for us as God's people to gather together, and we can sing these truths. We can affirm this is truth. It is another thing for us to trust in them. To take the truths that we are singing about and reading of as God reveals them and align our lives to them. How should I see myself? How should I see others? I need to bring my emotions and my reactions and my thinking and, and my perspective in line with truth. Am I trusting in these truths? The life that I live, does it communicate that I believe that these truths in Scripture are true and they are also trustworthy? And I want to walk through these verses with this question that we're going to answer. Well, what is it that is true and trustworthy in Revelation? And I want us to notice three different, three different things that as John is going through this conclusion, as he's having this interaction, this conversation, kind of three big ideas, three big uh, truths that are trustworthy for us that I, that I want us to just kind of draw out this morning. Here's the first one. Verses 6 through 9 emphasize a truth within Revelation and Scripture that there is a hierarchy throughout Revelation, chapters 1 through 22. There's a hierarchy that is here, that present. We're not reading about a story of equals. It is a story of God on the throne and mankind in subjection to him. There is a hierarchy here. Just notice with me. I want to, let me read verses 6 through 9. 
And he said to me, These words are trustworthy and true. And the Lord, the God of the spirits of the prophets, has sent his angel to show his servants what must soon take place. And behold, I am coming soon. Blessed is the one who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. I, John, am the one who heard and saw these things. And when I heard and saw them, I fell down to worship at the feet of the angel who showed them to me. But he said to me, you must not do that. I am a fellow servant with you and your brothers, the prophets, and with those who keep the words of this book. Worship God. There's a hierarchy here. We see that God is, first of all, he is omniscient. Jesus is the omniscient one. God is the one who is communicating. He is the God of the spirit of the prophets in verse 6. Repeated out through, through all of these, uh, these verses here, verses nine, 7, 9, 10, 18, and 19, you see this phrase, this idea, the words of the book, or the words of the prophets, or the words of the prophecy of this book. You have God who knows and who is revealing. This is significant for us. God of the prophets and God of John the prophet. The revelation that we have is God's revelation to mankind. And it is a revelation about the prophecy, about the future. It is only God who knows the future. Mankind depends upon God for truth. Whether that's about the future or today. God is the omniscient one. Jesus is the omniscient one. God has been revealing truth consistently throughout history. And all of Scripture, these 66 books, are unified. Not because the 30 or so authors got together to figure it out. It is because there is one author that it is unified and together in one. He is the omniscient one. He is the one who is revealing truth. Not only is he the omniscient one, he is also the sovereign one here. Jesus is the one who is sending. He is sending the angels to John. Jesus is the one who is giving revelation. The Holy Spirit is the one who is inspiring and assuring that the words are true. Jesus is the one who is sending the angels. And really, this should kind of pique our interest and remind us that the next time I read through Revelation and I see angel here, angel, 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 I need to recognize that every one of those angels are a sent angel. And they are sent by the one who is ruling and sovereign. And that angel pairs himself up with John. When John goes to worship, he's like, no, 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 I'm a fellow servant. Jesus is the sovereign one. The one who is organizing and ordaining and bringing about all of these things. He's the orchestrator. And Jesus is the one who is blessing. Throughout this these word throughout these uh, these verses here you notice some blessings. Verse 7. Blessed is the one who keeps the words of the prophecy. Verse 14. Blessed are those who wash their robes. And there's blessing for those who keep and hear the words. Jesus is in the position to bless. John is not. Jesus is. He's the sovereign one. He's the ultimate one. He's the only one in these verses who is worthy of worship. Multiple times throughout Revelation, we've seen John fall down and worship and it being an angel. The angel's like, no, not me. Jesus. There's nobody here on this earth in your life that is worthy of your worship. Only Jesus Christ. He is the ultimate one. 
He's also the coming one. Verse 7, Jesus says, I am coming soon. In verse 12, I am coming soon. And in verse 20, surely I am coming soon. Resonating through all of these verses, throughout Revelation, is this truth and the reality that Jesus is coming. The ultimate, sovereign, omniscient one is coming. The fourth vision, Jesus has already come. The larger message of the book of Revelation in these concluding words is a reminder that the ultimate, sovereign, omniscient one is on his way. He's coming. And he is gracious and merciful. Now, grace and mercy are not necessarily literally found in these verses. But just the fact that God is making these things known is an act of mercy. Is an act of his grace and his favor on his people. John doesn't stand in a position where he's like, God, you owe me this. You, you owe communicating these things to me. John doesn't have that kind of claim on Jesus. No person does. Nobody has any dirt on Jesus to kind of blackmail him and say, you know what, if you don't tell me about this, look what I'm going to show the world. The fact that God has revealed anything at all to mankind is an act of his grace and his mercy. Does Jesus need to tell us anything about the future? No. But out of his grace and his mercy, he has made this known to us. There is a hierarchy in Revelation. God ultimately supreme, Jesus in preeminent reigning. We also see mankind in Revelation. We see it here in these verses, in this interaction. You see mankind who is needing grace and mercy because of our fallenness. You see mankind. Mankind, John is the servant of Jesus. He's subordinate to God. Their will, their actions are in subordination to God's. They're wrapped up in God's will, in God's desires. Jesus is on the throne. You and I are servants of Jesus. Followers of Jesus. Every day ought to be like in the garden. Not what I want today, God. Your will. There's a hierarchy here. We are the receivers. We're not the determiners of truth. We don't establish truth. We are the receivers of truth. We're the keepers. Blessed are those who hear and keep. The expectation on our lives is to obey and align our lives and conform our lives to the truth, to what is true and trustworthy. Not to demand that of God or other people. We're the keepers. We're the obeyers. We're not the establishers. The expectation is on us, not the other way around. We are the ones who, we are the blessed ones. We are the ones who receive the blessing. And we are the worshipers. We're the ones who give worship, express worship, not the ones who receive worship or expect or want worship. We're to be like that angel that says, not me, Jesus. We're supposed to be like John the Baptist that says, behold the lamb. He's there. Yet how often times do our lives kind of flip this hierarchy around? I mean, these are important truths. This is an important relationship that we cannot afford to miss. I am not God. You are not God. Nor should we live like we're gods of our lives. 
We're not the determiners of what is true and trustworthy. We're the receivers of what is true and trustworthy. We're the ones with expectations placed on our lives, not in a position to place it on God. We're the ones who serve God's purposes, His plan and intentions. We're not trying to conform God to our lives, our purposes, plans. I align to Him, not the other way around. Is that how your life looks this week, last week? Does it reflect this hierarchy? It's not just here in these verses. It's throughout all of Revelation. It's throughout all of Scripture. Where our lives reflect this hierarchy. As we keep moving, verses 10 through 16, we see the second kind of truth kind of bubbling to the surface. Verse 10 And he said to me, Do not seal up the words of the prophecy of this book, for the time is near. Let the evildoer still do evil. Let the filthy still be filthy. And the righteous still do right, and the holy still be holy. Behold, I am coming soon, bringing my recompense with me, to repay each one for what he has done. I am the Alpha. I am the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Blessed are those who wash their robes that they may have the right to the tree of life, that they may enter the city by the gates. Outside are the dogs and sorcerers, the sexually immoral, the murderers, idolaters, and everyone who loves and practices falsehood. I, Jesus, sent my angel to testify to you about these things for the churches. I am the root and the descendants of David, the bright and morning star. There is justice in Revelation. What is true and trustworthy is that there is justice. Verse 11 kind of gives us, a, maybe it causes you to raise your eyebrows a little bit. What is Jesus saying here? Where he says, let the evildoers still do evil. Let the filthy still be filthy. Let the righteous still do right and the holy still be holy. It's almost as if Jesus is saying, all of the wicked out there, keep doing wicked. Keep being wicked. All the righteous, keep being righteous. Why would Jesus tell the wicked to still be wicked? Well, verse 10 kind of, Helps, out, helps us understand this a little bit. And I want to walk through one of the themes in Scripture that this is kind of tied into. John is told, don't seal up the words of the prophecy of this book. Don't seal them up. In other words, don't close them and keep them from the general people, population, if you will. Don't hide them. Rather, open them. Therefore, all to hear. It is to be made known. And it really kind of brings us back to the book of Daniel. This unsealing solidifies the spiritual conditions. And I want to get back to that. But Daniel chapter 12. Daniel is also being given visions of the future, a prophecy for the future. And he says, and he said, go your way, Daniel, for the words are shut up and sealed until the time of the end. So Daniel is given the prophecy. Angel tells him, seal it up. They are for the future, not for right now. Then he goes on. Many will purify themselves and make themselves white and be refined, but the wicked are going to act wickedly. None of the wicked are going to understand, but those who are wise will understand. There's two directions here. Daniel was to seal it up. John opens it up. It is now made known. It is available. And this unsealing solidifies spiritual conditions. Notice what the prophet Isaiah is told. And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? And then Isaiah says, Here I am. Send me. God says, Go and say this to the people. Keep on hearing but don't understand. Keep on seeing, but don't perceive. Make the heart of this people dull and their ears heavy and 
blind their eyes, lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their hearts and turn to be healed. And then in Jesus' ministry, we don't have the time this morning to turn there, but in Jesus' ministry in Matthew chapter 13, verses 9 through 17, Jesus is teaching in parables. And his disciples are like, why are you teaching in parables? And Jesus' answer is Isaiah 6. I teach in parables because my people will understand and the wicked will not. They will continue in their wicked ways. There is a hardening in the wicked. There was a hardening in Pharaoh. A hardening of his heart that God allowed to continue to be hardened. There was a hardening in, hardening in Israel as they rejected God. The continual rejection becomes solidified and God allows sin to be the punishment of sin. You will harden your heart and you will remain hardened. We see that in Romans chapter 1. We see it in Jesus' ministry by the religious leaders Hardened hearts that just continued to be hardened. And with the revelation and the giving of truth solidifies spiritual conditions. There is a, a continual hardening for those who harden themselves through their rejection of what is true and trustworthy. And there is a continual aligning for those who hear and submit. And this unsealing of revelation, this truth being made known, solidifies these spiritual conditions. Sin is the punishment for sin. Not only is there this unsealing that solidifies spiritual conditions, Jesus says that in his coming... He brings his recompense, his justice. He brings blessing for those who have washed their robes, who have been made alive and washed clean. And for those that have been sanctified, those who have been made holy, they have a right to the tree of life. And they have a right. They may enter into that city, this new Jerusalem, through the gate. They have access. But for those who have hardened their hearts and rejected, Jesus says, they're on the outside. Those that are on the outside, those that have hardened their hearts and just continued in sin and in rejection, are those that have just embraced sin. The dogs, the filth, the sorcerers, the sexually immoral, the murderers, the idolaters, everyone who loves and practices, underline that word, falsehood. What is true and trustworthy? And what is Every sin has its root in falsehood. Jesus brings his judgment with him, his recompense, his reward. The reward for sin is eternal outside, away from God's blessing. The reward for faith in Jesus Christ is a right to the tree of life and to walk through that gate. Don't harden your heart, please. Don't harden your heart to the true 
and trustworthy revelation of God. Do not continue to harden your heart. Submit. Humbly yield to what is true and trustworthy. Jesus tells John here, in verse 16, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you about these things for the churches. This justice that we see in the book of Revelation, this coming of Jesus and bringing his recompenses, his justice, is meant to wake up the church. It's why you have chapters 2 and 3 at the beginning. For those churches, but for Grace Baptist Church, we study Revelation to wake up as a reminder, as an alarm that Jesus is preeminent, that God is on the throne, that he is coming soon. And we, as God's people, as his people here at Grace Baptist Church, need to wake up from our spiritual lethargy, apathy. Yes, we gather on Sundays, but there's no fire or fervor or energy for God on Tuesday or Friday. We're consumed with everything else in this world except Jesus. As God's church, we need to break off this lukewarm love that we were reading about earlier. A lackadaisical commitment, an apathetic love, love in words only. Lukewarm. As God's church, we need to wake up from our doctrinal infidelity. Holding truths that are not consistent with Scripture. We need to wake up from our passive faithfulness. Doing only what's bottom line necessary for Jesus. Doing the minimum rather than the maximum. And we need to wake up from our worldly possessiveness. We have our hands wrapped up in hugging everything that is temporary in this world. As the church, we need to wake up and just let go of these things and embrace the return of Jesus Christ. Embrace what is eternal. Embrace what is true and trustworthy. Jesus is like, I'm telling you these things. This is for the church because we need to wake up. Verses 17 through 21, we see that there is hope in Revelation. There is hope. The Spirit and the Bride say, you say the word. The Spirit and the Bride say, oh, come on, you can do better than that. The Spirit and the Bride say, come. Let the one who hears say, come. Come. Let the one who is thirsty come. Let the one who desires the water of life without price. I warn everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book. If anyone adds to them, God will add to him the plagues described in this book. If anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God will take away his share in the tree of life and in the holy city, which are described in this book. He who testifies to these things says, Surely I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with you all. Amen. There is a seriousness to what is true and trustworthy. There's a seriousness to it. That Jesus gives John a warning. Don't take away from what I have given to you that is true and trustworthy. Don't take it away. Neither add, don't you dare add to what is true and trustworthy. 
The one who takes away, eternal life is taken away. Those who add all the plagues in this book are added. A mark of the unbeliever, a mark of someone whose heart is hardened, is someone who takes the revealed truth of God and will just kind of add to it or take away from it. There's a seriousness to the true, what is true and trustworthy. And for the person of God, for the follower of Jesus Christ, that seriousness creates anticipation. Because if this is true and trustworthy, and if the soon coming of Jesus Christ is true and trustworthy, and if we will just take the word of God seriously, take revelation seriously, we will be overcome with anticipation that Jesus is coming soon. That there is hope Spirit and the bride are saying, come. Those who are hearing, just come, Jesus. And everybody who's thirsty is coming. And Jesus reaffirms that I am coming soon. Every single day should be our words. Right here. That's right. Amen. Come. Lord Jesus. When was the last time we were just overcome with hope and anticipation that today could be the day that Jesus comes? Or are we so lackadaisical and lazy and apathetic in our faith that we could go weeks without thinking of the return of Jesus Christ. Where does, where does the joy well up for the believer in Jesus Christ? Where does the happiness and the excitement, where, where, does that, where does that well in our souls? It is right here. That we have at our fingertips what is true and trustworthy and that Jesus is coming soon should make us smile. We should be anticipating. I mean, we get happy in anticipation for lots of things. A break from school, vacation from work, and we get antsy. We're just like, oh, I gotta, I'm, I'm going to finish well so that I can have this break. We're going to see family. We're going to fill in the blank. And, and we just find ourselves with like this energy to finish well and to get it done. And just we, we long, we're just anticipating an excitement. I know it's in there. We all experience it. But does this generate it? Come, Jesus Christ. You've told us that you are coming soon. Come, please challenge you this week every single day first words out of your heart and mind Jesus let today be the day look for Jesus look for him every single day this week ask for him Jesus will you just please come today and live for him Look for Jesus, ask for Jesus, live for Jesus. My mind was directed toward the Apostle Paul again. Philippians chapter 1. Paul lived a life where he was looking for Jesus, asking for Jesus, and living for Jesus. Listen to these words as we finish this morning. Paul writes, Yes, and I will rejoice. For I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance, as it is my eager expectation and hope that I will not at all be ashamed, 
but that with full courage, now as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. For me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. If I am to live in this flesh, that means fruitful labor for you. Yet which I shall choose, I cannot tell. I'm hard-pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and to be with Jesus, for that is far better. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy in the faith, so that in me you may have ample cause to glory in Christ Jesus because of my coming to you again. That struggle and desire in Paul should be every day for us. I want to be with Christ. Jesus, come soon. Please come today. But if you tarry, I will live for you. And I will look for you. And I will live for you. Our Heavenly Father, you have shown your grace and your mercy in abounding ways in giving us Jesus Christ in giving us this truth. And because of who you are, it is trustworthy. As we are going to sing, Jesus is the hope of the nations. Father, I pray, on behalf of this part of your body, Jesus, please come quickly. And it's in your name we pray. Amen.